So many of you, um, all of you are teachers and, and I, probably all of you are aware that there has been um, considerable conversations around the topic of race and racism in our, in our country uh, and, uh, and particularly uh, recently. And so we want to give a, a, a bit of a, uh, a bit of insight into how we are uh, approaching this work. We will be sharing uh, key ideas that come out of the study of racism, um, things that we talk about in our own work and uh, our own research and in, our, in our, our teaching that we think will be useful and helpful for you as you move forward. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and give you all a brief overview of some of the topics that really set us up to understand what's happening in the early Republic time period and how that relates to African-American history and the history of slavery. Um, there's a timeline here on this slide and some of the events I will be covering in this miniature lecture that I'll cover for the next 10 minutes. Um, and others I'm just gonna sort of mention briefly and you'll discuss the ones that are asterisks um, those are, we'll have some documents related to those events, okay? So one of the things I think is important, um, and this is something that really um, has been something that I've had lots of conversations with as of late, um, particularly as Dr. Brown was saying that the conversations we've had since the spring, um, uh, that since the death of George Floyd and, and many others, is a lot of questions around race. How do we get here? How do we understand this? And one of the one of the main aspects of teaching that I've experienced is that people just don't know um, the African American experience in the United States, and or when it's covered, it's not been covered in great detail. So I want to provide you with the context of the early Republic, which many of you have already been teaching for a while, um, and what was going on with African Americans at that time. So this is you know on the this is on the aftermath of the American Revolution. Um, uh, in 1783, we know that because during the American Revolution, um, that Blacks were encouraged to um, become loyal to um, Britain. And if they were, if they were going to be loyal to Britain, they would be given their freedom. This was Lord Dunmore's proclamation. Some of you probably are very familiar with that. Um, there were a number of African Americans, I, I think um, about 30,000 that fled to Nova Scotia. Um, they had to make their way to New York first, and then they were taken on boats into Nova Scotia. So when we talk about the African diaspora, this is one of the ways that the peopling of people of African descent made it to Canada. Um, and that is through the American Revolution and running away at that time. Um, so 1783, the country is trying to establish themselves. It's a new young nation. Um, there's also at the same time, there's gradual abolition laws where the abolitionist societies are picking up, uh, sorry, there are uh, gradual, gradual uh, um, emancipation legislation starts to begin, but this is also the beginning of anti-slavery societies. Some of the anti first, some of the first anti-slavery societies are founded at this time around the American Revolutionary generation, and they really take off in the peak of the antebellum era. In the 1830s is really the, the, the um, primary area era of um, anti-slavery activity, but it's been going on the entire time. Um, so you have the development of these two. The, the uh, emancipation and looking at what would life be like for African Americans as free people. Um, what does it mean when we're having conversations in a new nation about liberty and about freedom? What does that mean? Um, what does it mean when um, those free people are people that have been enslaved? Um, so those are some of the things. Um, we're gonna then talk about the Northwest Land Ordinance in a few minutes. Um, the Haitian Revolution, which there are things that happen outside of the United States that have a significant impact on what's happening in this new nation. Um, there's fugitive slave legislation that also um, forces people in the North to participate in slavery in ways that they may have not before, but we'll talk about that. And then finally, the invention of the cotton gin, um, slave rebellions and conspiracies, large land purchases with the Louisiana Purchase, expeditions to explore West uh, and the whole idea of manifest destiny. And then um, the War of 1812 is where I'm gonna stop. But we really look at the early Republic oftentimes through 1820 and that's when 1820 to 1860 is considered the antebellum years. Um, next slide, please. So the Haitian Revolution, as I, as I mentioned a few uh, moments ago, is often um, overlooked as an event that didn't have any connection to the United States. And it really did because a number of the enslaved people 
who were who took their freedom as part of this uh, revolution came to the United States. They came to Louisiana. Um, and I'm, I'm depicting here, we wanted to show you one way for teaching that you can use um, contemporary and even um, previous, um, previously, previous artists who are no longer living, use their work to teach the history that you're teaching in your class. So using art as a way to um, fill in the gap for when we may, be, we may not have photographs. Um, this, this is the artwork of Jacob Lawrence, an African-American artist. He did a whole series on the Haitian Revolution. Um, and the first picture is Toussaint L'Ouverture, and I, my French is horrible, so pardon me um, if I'm mispronouncing any of these words. Um, and one of the reasons why I liked to show his art is that it shows um, some active nature of those uh, formerly free Blacks, mulattoes, and enslaved people that fought for their independence. Um, and also I like these images because there are women present and you see women as rebels and you see women um, um, being rescued. So you see men and women being rebels and men and women being rescued. So um, I've, oftentimes when we talk about the Haitian revolution, we talk about Toussaint L'Ouverture, Henry Christophe, and we also talk about um, uh, Jean Deslanes, and we, but we don't talk about women that were involved. So I just wanted to mention that, that women were present and they were actively involved in overthrowing, um, overthrowing French and Spanish rule on the island. So um, we know that uh, Columbus colonized uh, Haiti in 1492. Um, he changed the name, the Spanish side to Hispaniola to, to, um, after the Spanish government. Uh, in 1697, the French took over a large portion of the Western side of the island and named it Saint-Domingue or, or Saint-Domingue. Uh, Saint and then the French, um, were, they brought with them enslaved people from Africa and they used them to, um, to populate the island and work on the plantations there. Toussaint L'Ouverture was a, was a formerly enslaved person who led this large scale rebellion um, where blacks were in battle. And this is how um, they, became, they re, were able to get their freedom on the Spanish side. And then later, um, Christophe and, and Deslanes also, uh, I'm saying his name wrong because I'm thinking about Charles Deslandes, sorry. Um, at any rate, um, they were able to get their freedom. They were able to free the other side of the island. Um, and this was in 1804, 1791, to 1804. I think it's really important to think about the thrust of, of um, independence, the thrust of African Americans claiming their independence, the thrust of how long they're willing to fight, um, and how many lives were lost in the process. So I think that is a really important aspect of this. And why does it matter? Because it impacts, it, it, the, the news travels to the United States, um, this young nation, which, as we'll see in seventeen in the seventeen nineties, slavery takes off in another way. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but this is like through this sort of grapevine, through through travel, through people on ships in the shipping industry, um, African Americans in the United States are hearing about an, a, a a large scale rebellion that then grants Africans people of African descent their freedom, and so that's very important because there were only about thirty thousand um, free black people. Uh, in 1789 on the island, but there was about 500,000 enslaved people. It's a very small island and to have that many enslaved people, they outnumbered colonial, um, colonial officials 10 to one. So there was a black majority in the space. And um, then they also had organization and, and leadership and they were able to overturn and become this, um, to, to become independent. So the Haitian revolution really does set a tone for what's gonna happen here. Um, this was, uh, it ends in 1804. We know that one of our, the Gabriel Prosser conspiracy happened in 1800. So other African, people of African descent, other African Americans are rebelling against the institution of slavery or they're planning rebellions against the institution of slavery. I'm not saying it's just because of the Haitian revolution, but it shows them that the possibility of achieving freedom, freedom is something that, that's within reach. And they also heard the United States during the American Revolution talk about liberty and breaking the bonds of, of the breaking the, the bonds from the mother country when they talked about the United States claiming their independence in 1776. Um, next slide, please. So um, another another important event around this same time is the Northwest Land Ordinance. And what does this mean for African American history? It's gonna it's gonna make some sense shortly. Um, but you probably have taught this in your classes. We know that this, this particular region, the, the region in green on the map, um, all of those states were protected. Um, they were protected, um, they were protected territory where they were not allowed to have slavery. So slavery is protected in these spaces. Um, and so that has an impact later on, if you foreshadow, that has an impact on what's gonna happen with 
the North Southern, the Northern Southern divide that we have on, on the coming of the Civil War. So they didn't know it at the time, but this, this is the beginning of this sectional crisis where they're going back and forth about which states are gonna be admitted as free states, which states are gonna be admitted as slave in slave states. So you see that, and some of this is even beginning when you're dividing up and carving out spaces and saying there will be no slavery here or there will be slavery here. So that's a really important um, moment in our time period. Um, it protected the civil liberties of, of, human, of American citizens, but it also outlawed slavery in these new territories. Okay, next slide, please. We know um, that at the beginning of, of the 19th century, um, there were about um, 36,000 enslaved people in the North. And, um, you know, we often think that slavery was a Southern institution. But we do know that there were a number of enslaved people, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago about this, this notion of, um, of gradual abolition, we find that some of the northern states after the American Revolution are beginning to come up with platforms and programs to emancipate their enslaved people. They had restrictions though. Some of them were you have to reach the age 18 or you have to be 21 years old or 25 years old. Um, and, and you had to be enslaved before 1799 or after 1799. So there's different born before or after. So this is why you see slavery in Northern communities even well into the 19th century, okay? And a lot of, that's a misunderstanding that people often have that there was no slavery, there were no enslaved people in the North. So I just wanted to say that before we talk about moving to the West. Um, so we know that our land mass doubled literally with the Louisiana Purchase. Um, the United States received 827,000 square miles of land west of the Mississippi for the fair, fair, very low price of $15 million. Um, Thomas Jefferson purchased this land from the French government. This is also the same year, uh, and it, well, a year after with the Lewis and Clark expedition, but this is right around the same time that the Haitian Revolution is ending. And, and we know that Napoleon was literally pushed off of the island of Haiti. So he's now, he's been pushed out of the colony um, that he had in the Caribbean, and now he's giving up property on what is becoming the United, what's become the United States. So some people argue that this for Thomas Jefferson was his idea of manifest destiny. This was his way of exercising this notion of, of manifest destiny, which becomes much more clear um, a little bit later on as we talk about um, the push, the gold, the gold rush and all that in the 19, in the 1850s. So this was a big, a big deal. Um, at the same time though, um, Jefferson wanted to explore what was out there in the West, see if they had a trade route to the East. Um, and so he, um, he went ahead and commissioned an expedition from 1804 to 1806 with um, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. And, and this was uh, the 31 Corps of Discovery. And so there's, this was about 31 other people were with them. Um, but who was also with them was, a, was an enslaved man um, by the name of York. And may, you may or may not have heard of him. I put an article um, from the Washington Post in the packet for you all or as a resource that I think would be really useful. I think York is a great um, person to talk about uh, when teaching this history at this moment. Um, because he's so much a part of these records, but he's been erased um, by scholars and by historians and, and, and the ways in which they've talked about him until more recently. Um, so York was there and you're gonna look at some of the stuff that York was doing, um, but they traveled west, they, um, they went to the, they went and they wanted to make connections. They, they traveled along the Ohio River. Um, they looked at waterways. Um, there's documents that I gave you all access to later that has like pictures of, if you look at their, their journals, all the people, some of the 31 cores of discovery that were there, they have sketches of the different birds and the different trees that they saw. They, saw. they had um, sketches of lakes and rivers and they were renaming them um, from the native names that they had from Native American and indigenous communities. So as they were going on this expedition, they were also erasing a culture and a community by renaming them um, in the process. Um, so this was a really important expedition, as you know. Um, and I think that at that time, um, York was used as someone who could in, was was could use as an interpreter. Um, he was also someone that that people were surprised because some people had never seen a person of African descent. So you'll see some of that in the documents that you'll look at. But I just think one of the important things is that he was there. Um, we know that there was also a Native American woman that accompanied him, and there's been some controversy over um, their role as well. Um, all right, next slide, please. I want you to look at this. It's, it's going to loop. Um, 
This is the growth of the enslaved population as we go from the first census of 1790 up into, it should go again, um, uh, first census of 1790 through, I thought it went through the um, 1860s, but it looks like it paused. Hmm. Um, you can see the, the number of enslaved people by the, by the dawn of the uh, antebellum period and how slavery is shifting to the deeper South and it's shifting to places um, where they're now migrating and moving West. So as Westward expansion comes, it really does breathe new life into the institution of slavery. And so you'll see that here. Um, we know that by uh, 1820, um, the United States produced about 170 million pounds of cotton. I always have my students hold a cotton ball. And if you think about what does 170 million pounds of that feel like? What does 10 pounds of a cotton ball feel like? It's almost hard to predict that. Um, at any rate, um, and we know that about, um, about 5 million pounds in 1793 alone, which was the year that the cotton gin was invented. Um, by 1830, cotton was the most important export crop in the United States and was the centerpiece of our economic development, predominantly in the southern states. But northern states, as I mentioned earlier, were also um, benefited from this institution. Um, we know that New York banks benefited from slavery. Um, they financed slave owners. And we know that nor the northern industries also supported um, the running of cotton, cotton plantations by providing clothing and shoes, tools, leg irons, and so forth. So um, I'll go, go on to the next slide because I know I'm running out of time. Oh, now it's moving. <laughs> We're gonna, it, you saw it moving now. You can see how the, I will look, thank you. Just wanna let you all see that for a moment. So you can see how it moves, it's shifting further west. Okay, great, thank you. So I wanna watch a short video, three minutes on the expansion of cotton. Thank you. So I think one of the points that I wanted to make here was the growth of the cotton industry and what that does to the institution of slavery as we move into the 19th century, as the nation, nation becomes more, um, more whole and recovering from the Civil War, and as we move into what becomes cotton as king. Um, next slide, please. And I want to um, close my remarks with um, at, just as we get over the, the hump of, of a, one war, we have what they call the Second War for Independence, the War of 1812. And there were many African Americans that were actively involved in this particular war. Um, you're going to be learning about them in your breakout sections in a few minutes. But we know just like the American Revolution, some African Americans fled to Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, they were similar efforts that began during the American Revolution that encouraged them to come um, to Canada. We have an image on the far right of Gabriel Hall. Um, that's the only image, I think, a photograph that we have of someone who participated in the War of 1812. And the reason why I'm showing you this picture of him on the far right um, is that he was around 13 years of age. And I, I know many of you are eighth grade teachers. And I was thinking that what does it mean for a 13 year old to go um, volunteer to, uh, to participate in the war? We know also um, other, other blacks like Jordan, Jordan Noble, who's pictured in the center was also, um, a, they, they marched and they were the drummers from the war. Um, but he also was also 13 when he participated in the, in the US Army. Um, they were fighting for their freedom and um, we also have a little bit of evidence on what the experience was like from a formerly enslaved person named Charles Ball, who was sketched on the left um, with the uniform and the, and the, uh, and the top hat. Um, so you're gonna be looking at some documents in a few minutes. Um, I've given you a little more information about Gabriel Hall in your documents, but I want you to think like, what does it mean um, to fight uh, in the military for a country that considers you a problem or a country that, that wants to have you remain enslaved. So that's the question I'll, I'll leave you with and I'll turn it over now to my colleague, Sarkis Brown. Thank you. Hi, okay, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So we'll talk a bit about um, some key constructs. Uh, I'll start off and then um, Anthony Brown will uh, finish, finish us up. Uh, the first thing that we want to uh, have you think about is just 
uh, about the presence of racism in U.S. history. Um, and, and what we are, what we are uh, arguing is that there's, an, there's a need for us to actually see race. Um, some of the histories that uh, Dr. Barry just uh, shared, um, she sort of uh, recognizes that when those histories were written, they were written where they, they recognized that there were black people that were a part of history. So in 1812, um, there were black people who, who fought in that war. Unfortunately, when that, those stories get told in curriculum, when they get translated into textual knowledge for, for, for students, that those histories are sometimes rendered invisible. And this is what happens in curriculum. And we have a history of this happening in curriculum. And so here we, we're, we're wanting you to think about the notion of colorblind racism. And colorblind racism is just simply uh, a, a form of racism that doesn't acknowledge race. It's there, often we see it, but we don't uh, want to account for it or deal with it because it, it creates complications or it, 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 it asks us to question some of the narratives or the stories that we've been told about um, our nation, the curriculum, uh, the society that we live in. And so what we are, what we are arguing for is that we, we think about um, seeing race and not engage in colorblind racism, which is one of the reasons why we are spending time talking about racism and its place in, in uh, the US historic narrative. Next slide, please. So uh, it is imperative that it, if we're going to talk about race, that we actually acknowledge the social constructed nature of race. And what's been uh, nice even about this, this, this talk so far is that we see that race is not something that is innate in people, right? It is not a sort of genetic quality. It is something that gets constructed uh, and has gotten constructed through our histories and our practices. Um, and when we go back to the history of enslavement, uh, we recognize that there was a social construction of race because only a, there was only a certain type of person who was classified um, uh, as a particular kind of racial being that would be a, a Negro or, or a person of African descent that uh, uh, was considered uh, someone who could be enslaved for life. Um, and one of the ways that the social, the way that so, the social construction of race happens is through the, the sort of uh, relationships between science, laws, everyday practices, the stories that we tell, popular culture, policy. All of these things help to create uh, what we understand as race. And I'll turn it over now to uh, Dr. Brown. I just want to add one other thing about the so about colorblind ideology. If we think about colorblind ideology as the process by which groups are seen with absence of their race, which I think we, we could all agree is a good thing in the sense that they're seen as humans, they're seen as peers. What colorblind ideology suggests is that those histories are removed. So what we call colorblind curriculum, in the sense that history serves as a as a anchor it holds in place the idea that groups are purely autonomous. We act as individuals. Nothing has ever intervened. Housing laws have ne not impacted us. The history of slavery, is, it, it took place in a particular time, had no material implications over time. But I think what we want you to understand is that students also have to understand those relationships. So when we think about the social construction of race, we're trying to get teachers to understand this idea of a thesis-driven approach to teaching. The idea that you take race as a way in which to anchor it, not to have it as a footnote, because it's, it's glaring for many students. Like one group is clearly positioned as the racialized group to do the labor, to be, you know, to suffer, to, to, to gain no material wealth from the institution, 
where others are able to gain from that. They have protection of the law, they can gain economic wealth and all the things that are attached to it. But what seems to be missing from much of the K-12 curriculum is that answering the question of like, what created it? Uh, and I think we just think of racism as this ubiquitous thing. It's ubiquitous and seemingly ubiquitous. But I think one of the things that Dr. Barry, Dr. Brown and I want to, the, the message we want to get home is that if race is a social construction, that means it was constructed. Another way to think about it is the social creation of race. And if you think about it as a creation, that somebody, there were creators. So if we go, if we refer to Thomas Jefferson is asked to kind of, he gives this, which turns out to be like a testimony about the greatness of America. It's almost like a sales pitch. It's the only book he wrote. It's, in it, it's, it's called The Notes of Virginia. Some of you are familiar with it, 1781. But a key part of this social construction, he gives these very problematic anecdotes, but it's, it's at the end of the section of the book where he quotes and sets up what becomes uh, sets up the necessity for scientists and researchers to, to explore the question he poses here. And he states, to our reproach, it must be said that though for a century and a half we've had under our eyes the races of black and red men, they've never yet been viewed by us as subjects of natural history. I advance it, therefore, as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstance, are inferior to the whites in endowments of both body and mind. It is not against experience to suppose that different species of the same genus or varieties of the same species may possess different qualifications. So here you say, see that Jefferson is setting up the necessity to make African Americans, that as they called them, the ne American Negro, a, a naturally bred for slavery. So slavery doesn't become a condition of just um, repression where they're forced into bondage. That is certainly a key aspect to the history of early Republic. But part of the durability of racism is these other parts that we say here, the placement of popular culture, stories that are told, laws and practices. For example, the work of J.H. Vander Ever. I'm gonna read another passage where God is used as a justification for why African Americans should be naturally bred as slaves or speed viewed as slaves. Quote, the Negro is a different being from the white man and therefore of necessity was designed by the almighty creator to live a different life. And to disregard this, to shut our eyes and blindly beat our brains against the decree, the eternal purpose of God himself and force this Negro to live our life necessarily destroys him. So here you see this author is seeing this as like an act of benevolence, an act of care. So to anchor the ideas of race, social construction needs to reproduce it by people that are seen such as in legit, legitimate uh, sources of information. Academia, academia plays a significant role in this. Science plays a significant role in this. Presidents giving testimony around uh, the, the necessity for African Americans to be in bondage, but also in aspects of popular culture. Uh, the history of minstrelsy uh, brings forth uh, uh, the first recorded 18, 1808 is the first kind of act of blackface minstrelsy character, the, the character Jim Crow. He becomes the father of Mr. Thomas Dartmouth Daddy Rice, developed the first popularly known blackface minstrel character. Is born in 1808, and Rice became the traveling actor. And what you find is this is not just an innocent depiction of African Americans, it is, a, it is a defense for slavery. African Americans are seen as not capable to live in a civil society, not capable because of God or their intellect. Well, of course, we know the cranial studies played a significant role, but the social construction is intended to reproduce this idea in every facet of society to where the idea of being a slave and black were seen as synonymous. You can you go to the next slide, please? So here we have uh, what we want you to consider are, is a confluence of racism. Racism as being hovering around both the kind of micro depictions of slavery, which I think most of the kind of racialized aspects of slavery as it's seen as problematic 
are definite in, in, in textbooks are usually seen as plantation owners and people working on the plantation and the harsh life in these micro contexts. But another way to understand, and, and that is incredibly valuable, you have to understand that people's lives were anthropological. They were in these very, in these cultural milieus that differed, depended on the, the space you were in. I mean, one thing that Dr. Bear and other historians talk about is that we have this blanket notion that Maryland racism, Mississippi, I mean, Mississippi slavery, uh, Maryland slavery, all were the same. Uh, and we know that qualitatively that that was inaccurate. But the other way in which to th engage this kind of thesis driven idea of race and understanding slavery is to understand the structural and institutional implications of slavery. We, we, we leave out the fact that there was an accumulation, a dramatic accumulation of wealth in the video we saw. And wealth accumulation over time, it will be significant to the lives of those that benefited from that wealth accumulation, but also those that were left out of it. And the third component to racism that is key is this idea of internalized racism. The idea is that you'll see even reflected in some of the primary sources we'll uh, have today, which is you, you, when you're bound to a system of ideas for a long time, you as an individual or as a group begin to believe it. Um, uh, Carter G. Woodson refers to this as kind of miseducation. Uh, he, he made the idea that miseducation is, is set by a set of rules, a set of ideas, and those rules are intended to remove the oppressor and oppression become you govern yourself by these rules of, of, of racism. So thinking about this as a confluence of perspectives, you can engage these questions at every level from the early Republic through the Civil War and beyond. Next slide, please. So lastly, in thinking about these, we, we have this idea of, of an idea. So the left, the social construction of racism, I want you to think about this as the things that anchor in place the fact that African Americans were viewed as slaves. That is the social construction, that is the theologian, that is the scientist, uh, that is Thomas Jefferson. Those are the ideas that hold in place the fact that they are, con by, by, by biblical standards, by scientific standards, in popular culture, in every facet of society, they're made into be naturally bred to, to exist within this bottom. I mean, these ideas remain stable after slavery. They change a little bit. See, the, the, the key thing about representation is representation always takes place within the context of the economy that drives it. It's never separate from that. So as African-Americans gain more prosperity after Reconstruction, the idea of African-Americans being beast and of a threat becomes more prominent. It exists in the context of the kind of the Sambo the analogy of African-Americans being complicit and happy in their condition or brute and at any point could kind of move in between those. But the idea of the Sambo suggested that African-Americans enjoyed their experience. It was a happy existence um, in this kind of benevolent system. Um, but the key thing here too is to understand that ideas and experiences don't sit alone. There are material consequences to race that have long-term implications. And Dr. Barry tonight won't be able to speak to it, but I know she speaks about the economic cost the long-term cost, I mean, that even go into the mid 20th century, even into the 21st century, in terms of the uh, kind of the repression of economic growth uh, as African-Americans gained violence increases. So there's always this relationship between race being meaningful and groups having a natural placement within this kind of artificial racial hierarchy but they never just stand alone. They stand always in the context of material gains and material losses. And that's what we think about with social construction of races. Is it is a fiction. It's made by creators, but it has real consequences. And those consequences are often economic and sometimes existential. Next slide, please. But, Key to the, each of these theories, and you'll find this, uh, Dr. Barry's work does this really beautifully, places African-Americans in the most difficult situations, situations that seem 
they can't they reproduce themselves in such strident ways it seems as if african americans have no voice no agency and we would both are dr brown and i have done research on this in dr barry's work all of us argue that that is a flawed perspective so if you want to understand the conditions of repression and oppression for african americans in the context of slavery in the context even of Jim Crow, but in this case we're talking about the context of enslavement, you have to understand this idea of agency. And there's so many different levels of agency. There's what some refer to as the hidden transcripts of agency, meaning people were agenic and you may not have been able to see it. Expressions of joy, of community and family. And sometimes it was slave rebellions, you know, a ship rebellions, so real aggressive burns kind of not covert, very overt versions of resistance. And, and it's important that in thinking of a, a kind of thesis driven course for your eighth graders, they understand all of these ideas as they exist between the tensions of, of being in the context of enslavement, but resisting at the same time. And it gives humanity um, to those histories.